it began like every other day when you're with Jesus. People, people, people. Everywhere there's people. This one's sick. That one needs help. That one has a demon. And so we just served and listened as Jesus taught the crowds, waiting for his instruction because you never really know what Jesus is going to ask you to do next. And to my delight, Jesus suddenly said, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Now, this was music to my ears because I was a fisherman, and that's what I'd grown up doing, being on the lake. And so suddenly the thought of several hours of mindless rowing or better yet, just lift the sail and let catch the gentle breeze and we'll just relax across the lake away from all the crowds, away from all the people, and it will be a joyful afternoon for my soul. So we piled into the boat, all 13 of us, and headed out across the lake. Uh, of course, the four fishermen kind of handled the details. We rowed a little bit, hoisted the sail, caught the breeze, and just enjoyed the moment. The other disciples, they all kind of kicked back, relaxed, some of them napped, and Jesus, he went to the back of the boat, and he passed out. No doubt exhausted by the crowds and just their, their constant demands. I even thought about napping too, just getting ready to close my eyes when I just felt that gentle shift of the breeze, and it made me tense up on the inside just a little bit. I tried to convince myself it was nothing, but... I caught the eye of my brother, and, well, he felt it too. Sure enough, it wasn't long before that gentle breeze turned into a gale-force wind. And that lake that had been just calm was now a boiling cauldron. And, and, and we were being tossed around like nothing. The waves were crashing over the side of the boat. Well, the four of us that knew what to do, well, we started rowing like crazy. And we told the other disciples, bail, like your life depends on it. Because it probably does. I mean, we'd been in storms like this before. Uh, usually, though, you've got three or four guys on the, on, on the boat, and you just ride it out. But all of us had lost friends in this kind of tempest. And here we were, sitting low in the water, loaded down with 13 adults. Well, we were rowing. The other disciples were bailing, and, and they, they knew we were in trouble because they saw the fear in our eyes, and they heard the panic in our voices. And Jesus, he was just sleeping. Now, I don't even know how you can stay asleep in a boat that is being tossed around like a rag doll. I mean, the waves are crashing over. He's got to be getting wet, and yet he's still just passed out on that cushion in the back of the boat. And, and, and finally, out of desperation, one of the disciples who was close to him, I don't remember which one, just grabbed him on the, by the robes and shook him and said, Jesus, Master, Master, we're perishing! Jesus woke up with that look. You guys have all had it. You know, when you don't know where you are and you don't know what day it is, you don't know where you're supposed to be, there's that day's look. And, and Jesus said, quiet, be still. And, and I thought he was talking to the disciple who was shaking him to let go and calm down. But then I realized that the wind wasn't blowing. And the waves weren't crashing. In fact, it was perfectly calm. And the lake was like glass. We looked at each other in amazement. Just kind of that, what's going on here? Did that really just happen? And Jesus looked at us and said, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Now this story, a little bit shorter version of it, is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. I'm going to invite you to turn there in your Bibles. We're going to be looking at the story today. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, uh, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1100, and you will find Luke chapter 8. Um, and, and verse 22 through 25 is the whole story. Here's, here's what Luke says. One day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, 
and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and the water? And they obey him. Uh, if you're interested, there's accounts also in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Extremely similar. Just little tweaks on the, the conversation differences. But obviously this event impacted the disciples, and the lessons that are learned from it can change our lives too. So let me just share with you four thoughts out of this simple story. And by the way, if you grew up in church, uh, especially if you grew up in, as a child in church, you probably heard this story a hundred times. Maybe you even got a child's song, children's song, bouncing through your ears right now that's uh, related to this. So uh, if so, you can sing it for everybody at lunch because they probably don't know it. So here it is, four thoughts. This story, our lives, how it impacts. First of all, we will encounter storms even with Jesus in the boat. We will encounter storms even with Jesus in the boat. Uh, uh, so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus is always with you. In fact, the moment you confess Christ as Lord, God put the Holy Spirit in your life to be there forever until he calls you home to heaven. Uh, he's the guarantee of our salvation. He is with us. God is with you always, even in the storms. And yet somehow this crazy idea gets perpetrated over and over and over again. And people think, hey, if I trust Jesus, if I follow Jesus, then once he's in my life, I'm not going to have any more problems. He's going to fix everything and it'll be smooth sailing. The story kind of confronts that head on. I mean, Jesus was physically in the boat with the disciples, and they still encountered a storm. We're going to have storms in our life, even with Jesus in our lives. How do I know that? Because Jesus told us that. He, he never said it was going to be easy to be a follower of Christ. He said, hey, if you're going to follow me, you, gotta, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come after me. He said, hey, guess what? If the world hates you, don't be surprised because it hated me first. And so if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. He said, you're going to have tribulation in this world. Don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. So he, he made all these promises. If you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, you're going to see that followers of Christ suffered persecution and trials, even to the point of death. So expect the storms. They are part of this broken, sin-filled world. Whether it's the, the storms like of violence and hatred that rain down on our nation this week, or whether it's your personal tempests that rage in your life because you lost a loved one, because you got bad news about your health, because, well, financially you're sinking. Maybe your kids are addicts. Maybe your marriage is drowning. Look, the storms are a reality. It doesn't matter whether the source is other people or your own rebellious actions or the random evil that fills this broken world. The storms are just going to be part of life. And by the way, remember that when you're dealing with other people and they're irritating you. Have compassion for your fellow travelers because you may not be in a storm, but they might be in the midst of a storm and they might be thinking that they're drowning. And so have some compassion for them because we all are going to encounter storms along the way. So first thing is we're going to encounter storms even with Jesus in the boat. Second thing I'd share with you from the story that we tend to see is that we tend to panic in the storms. The disciples did. And we're not a whole lot better than they are, right? They freaked out because they thought they were going to die. Master, we are perishing. That's what they said in Luke 8. If you look in Matthew chapter 8, they say, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. My favorite, Mark chapter 4, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Yeah. So how do you respond in the midst of crisis? 
when life becomes tough, when things look bad, when you feel like you're drowning, do you respond like the disciples? In that midst of the, the crisis, do you cry out to God to save you? Lord, save us. Yeah, we've all been there, right? On our knees, desperate for God to do something because we're in a world of hurt. But are you like the disciples too? Do you ever accuse God of apathy? God, don't you care that I'm struggling? Don't you care? God, if you cared, you wouldn't let this happen to me. Or do you ever just give up hope and pronounce doom? The disciples did. We're going to drown. Master, we're perishing. Lord, help us. We're going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? They, they were hopeless, and they pronounced doom. So honestly, between you and God, are you more likely to panic in the storm or to be at peace in the storm? In the midst of the crisis, are you going to accuse God or are you going to affirm your faith? When it really gets tough, are you going to be the one who pronounces doom or are you going to verbalize hope? Because the storms are real and they tend to scare us. Third thing that I see in this story is that Jesus has power greater than the storm. Jesus has power greater than the storm. We know that. Jesus speaks a few words and the storm was done. It was finished. It was over. And that's what we want him to do in our lives too, isn't it? We want the spiritual easy button. God, can you just like speak a few words and make it all go away and fix it now? Wave your magic wand, do whatever you have to do, and just make it go away. And by the way, Jesus has the power to do that. He has the power, and one day he's going to use that power to completely and totally redeem this world. This broken, messed up world. You see, we believe that Jesus is going to come again. Uh, in, in case you missed our, our, one of our statements is about the Bible, we believe what the, the Bible says. And one of the statements about the Bible is this. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's the scriptural story. So Jesus is going to come again. We don't know when, but we know that he's going to. And when Jesus comes, he's going to conclude history as we know it. In other words, everything's going to change when Jesus shows up again. And, and so when he comes, he's going to make all things new. New heaven, new earth, new bodies, new lives, all that kind of stuff. All this old stuff's going to pass away, and he's going to bring justice to the world. Jesus has the power. Jesus has the power greater than any storm that you're in. Jesus has the power to forgive your sins. All your sins. Because, see, some of us think that God has the power to forgive most of our sins, and the other ones we carry around hoping that nobody ever finds out about them because we think that we're too guilty to really get God's grace. Oh, no, we sing about grace and we talk about it, but we don't really let it wash over our whole entire soul. And I just want you to know that God has the power to forgive all your sins, all of them. Let me just put it this way. Jesus' power to forgive is greater than your power to sin. That's the reality. He has the power to wipe the slate clean and to give you a fresh start. Jesus has the power to redeem your failures. Let that sink in. I don't really know how you see your life and, and all that kind of stuff, but every one of us has failed. And, and uh, historically, the church has been really good at taking people who were certain kinds of failures and marginalizing them. Oh, you can come, but, you know, just don't try to get involved. Don't try to lead. Don't try to be anything. And, and I just want you to know that's counter to the gospel. Because the gospel is, is about Jesus redeeming failures. Uh, by the way, out of the 12 disciples in the boat with Jesus, how many of them passed the test? None of them, right? They all failed it. They all failed it. And yet Jesus didn't say, okay, you guys are losers. Get out of the boat. Hope you know how to swim. Because you're not going to stick here with me. No, here's the good news. You know what the good news of the gospel is? Jesus loves losers. Isn't that great? 
I mean, it is so awesome when you realize that God does not think you're wonderful because you're wonderful. He thinks you're wonderful and he knows you're a loser. Wait, here's, let me just frame it even better. Okay, the Apostle Paul said, God chose the weak things of the world to confound the strong and the foolish to confound the wise. So here's what qualifies as a perfect candidate for God. Somebody who's weak, an idiot, and has failed. Yeah, some of you are like, hey, sign me up. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's okay. If God's using you in any way, shape, or form, those are the qualifications that, he, that he's grabbing hold of. So if you're being used by God, then you are a weak moron. <laughs> Congratulations, and the power of God is resting on you, uh, or me as the case may be. So, so understand, he loves to redeem our failures because that's kind of the kind of power that he has. He has the power to overcome your fear, wipe away your guilt, and, and just let go of your shame. He has the power. He has the power to, to heal your family. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, relationships that are broken, and, and God can put those back together. He has the power to, to heal our marriages. You know, so often in our, our broken marriages, what happens is, is both spouses start looking at the other and only seeing each other's faults. Only seeing those things that are wrong with that other person. They focus on they do this and they do that and they do that. And, and, and Jesus wants to show up in the midst of your relationship and, and put his arm around both of you and go, hey, look, let me heal this. Let me teach you how to both love each other and how to forgive each other and how to serve each other and so you can live in the love that I, I, I want to give you. He has the power to do that. He has the power to direct your job, to direct your ministry, to direct your steps in your personal life. He has the power. That's the reality. I hope that's something you can rejoice in today. But we, well, we want God to fix it, don't we? We want God to fix it now. Can I just confess, I'm lazy, and I like the idea of God fixing it. God, can you just come into my crisis, into my storm, and can you just make the wind and the wave stop and make everything perfect and fine? And we forget that we have a role to play in God's power. I want you to think about this. Um, where were the disciples when Jesus calmed the storm? Okay, they were in the boat. And where was the boat? It was in the middle of the lake. So Jesus calmed the storm. Boom. Wind and the waves stop. And they still have to get to the other side of the lake. You know what that meant, right? Yeah, they had work to do. They had work to do. If they were going to get where God wanted to take them, now they had work to do. And now there's no breeze because Jesus calmed the wind and the waves. They can't pour, hoist the sail. That's not going to do it. It's dead calm. Okay, I can just imagine the, the disciples rowing going, hey, Jesus, can you give us a little breeze now? <laughs> nope. You asked for calm. You got calm. So row away and be happy. See, but we don't like that. We just want God to go ahead and fix it and do all the work for us. We kick back and go, God, you are so good. Now, understand something. Salvation is a gift from God. You didn't do anything to get it. All right? Jesus died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He defeated sin and death and hell. Our salvation, our eternal life is all from Jesus. He gave it to you and he gave it to me. And then he wants us to do something with it. His power meets our lives, and we got to row. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 2. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Don't, you don't work for it. You work it out. You take the gift that God's given you, and you start rowing. You start working at it. You start saying, okay, God, your power and, and my life, and we're going to go somewhere. We're going to do something. But if we just sit back on the couch and eat Cheetos, really God's power is going to go to waste in our lives. See, Jesus has the power. That's the reality. Question is, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Now, this is a difficult question with a simple answer. Because if I walked around this room with a microphone and asked every single one of you, I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 of you would get the answer correct. Where is your faith? And you would all say, now, Jesus. <laughs> you guys got the answer right. Jesus, we all know the answer. We're in church. 
Jesus is the answer. We got that. We're going to pass the test. But we don't get off that easy. I want you to think about this. Jesus looked at the 12 men who had left their entire lives to follow him. Okay, they gave it all up. Gave up their jobs, left their families. They're following Jesus. They're seeing him heal people real time. They're not just reading about it in the book. They're seeing it happen. They're watching the miracles. They're seeing Jesus' power over demons. They're, they're uh, you know, hearing this amazing teaching firsthand. And they're witnesses to all of this. And Jesus looks at them and says, where is your faith? I don't think that they would get a pass by going, Jesus, it's in you. Where's your faith? See, words are not enough. You know, if you say the right answer enough times, you might convince yourself that's what you really believe. We can rehearse the part so that we're a convincing actor. But really, honestly, where is your faith today? Who or what are you trusting in to rescue you? Is it your bank account, your investments, your assets, your portfolio? Is it your spouse or your family or your friends or your pastor? Maybe you're trusting in yourself, your skills, your abilities, your intelligence. Or is it in the living God who has the power to calm the wind and the waves? You see, if our faith is in Jesus, then we will live like Jesus. We will actually take his words and apply it to our lives. And, and here's just something that occurred to me. We're never going to have faith in the storm if we don't walk with Jesus when it's calm. Think about that. We're not going to have faith in the storm if we don't hang out with Jesus when the storms aren't blowing. And, 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 and here's the toughest thing. When everything is good, when the sun is shining and, and everything is smooth sailing, that's when we tend to go, hey, thanks, Jesus. We're going to go hang out with some other people right now. And we ignore his word and we don't pray as much because the times are not difficult. And yet if we really want to have courage in the storm, we've got to hang out with Jesus when it's not storming. So are we trusting in Jesus? Where is our faith? I don't know. Let me ask you this. Are we going to try to love like Jesus even when the people that we try to love spew hatred back at us? Are we going to forgive crazily even if the people who offended us don't repent? Are we going to serve others joyfully even when the people that we serve are ungrateful? Will we give generously, even if we think we need it more than them? Will we see others with compassion instead of judgment, because that's how Jesus sees us? Will we never despair because we know that Jesus is with us and has promised to redeem us? Where is your faith? Jesus asked another question, Luke chapter 6. He said, why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? So we're going to have storms in this life. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living in a panic. I know Jesus has the power. I'm going to trust him completely. What are you going to do? Now, all that being said, we know that, that God has the power and we ask him to calm the storms in our life on a regular basis. But maybe, just maybe, God doesn't want to calm the storms in our life. Maybe God wants to change us so that we have the courage and the strength to stand in the storms. And in just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. We're going to pause and remember that Jesus died for us, for all of our sins. And he demonstrated his power on the cross. He demonstrated his power when he walked out of the tomb. And, and we want to say thank you to God for saving us. 
And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're invited to celebrate communion with us. What we're going to do in just a moment after I pray is we're going to get up from our seats. We're going to move to either the two tables at the front, the two on the sides, or the two in the back. And, and you're going to take the bread and the cup, which represent the body of Christ, and you're going to come back to your seat. And there you're going to pray, and you're going to wait. And when you are ready to say thank you to God, uh, then you're going to take the bread, which represents the body that is broken for you. And you're going to drink the cup, which represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And you're going to worship your Savior. But I want us to spend a few moments just in silence before we do that. It'll be uncomfortable for some of you, and that's okay. We're fine with that. And here's the thing. I want it to be really uncomfortable for all of us because I want us to ask God this question. God, how do you need to change me so that I'm strong in the storm? Yes, I'm going to keep asking you to calm the storm, but I really want to ask you to make me courageous so I can face the storm after storm after storm with my faith in you. Are you willing to ask God to do that today? Are you willing to trust him? Because he's looking at us and asking, where is your faith? Let's pray together.